eBay buys Golden. PSA buys the eBay Vault. And now eBay and PSA are working together on a lot of different fronts. Is this good or bad for the hobby? We're going to tell you what we think now. Hello, sports card investors, and welcome to another episode of Cards on the Table. Wow, there was some huge breaking news in the sports card world yesterday. There's a lot to break down, a lot of really important information for you as a collector, what this all means to you. And of course, today I'm joined by best-selling Amazon author, Teapot. Welcome to the show, my friend. And of course, what I'm referencing is Sports Card Collecting and Investing for Dummies, a book that you and I and Ben Burroughs wrote together. And it is now a bestseller on Amazon. Available now, by the way, on Amazon. Shipping now on Amazon. Sports Card Collecting and Investing for Dummies. And then there's Doug. How's it going, Doug? Glad to not be lumped in with the dummies, I guess. Well, you know, <laughs> I thought, I, I, thought I saw that setup coming, but... I don't know. Your basketball nice. team got rid of your head coach. That may prove to be a dummy move. By the I'm, time this airs, Scott Drew is probably the coach. So this is, you know, this won't be, you know, a very good coach. We'll see. I don't know. Kentucky, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's going on with the program I'm these not, days. By the way, I'm not pumped about that decision. I just think that's where it's going. Okay. All right. Well, good to know. Well, we're not here to talk about bad, bad college basketball today. We're here to talk about all of the breaking news that happened yesterday. So PSA, eBay put out statements early yesterday morning talking about this big business deal, multifaceted deal that was done between the two of them. PSA from eBay has bought the eBay vault. Now PSA already had their PSA vault. Now they have the eBay vault that they're merging in with the PSA vault. eBay bought from Collectors, the parent company of PSA, they bought Golden, which was of course the high-end auction house that PSA and e or Collectors had underneath their wing. And then the two companies, now that this has happened, they've agreed to work together on, on different fronts, including when you grade cards with PSA, you can immediately push them to eBay for sale. And in fact, they're gonna let you push them for sale the moment they're graded. So right when, the, right when you get the grade, you can immediately push it for sale, excel it, so it will actually go live on eBay the moment you get your grades from PSA. So it's, they're trying to accelerate the process, PSA says this is going to give collectors a seamless buying, selling, grading, and storage experience. eBay, of course, benefits from a lot more listings and a deeper relationship with the number one grading company. There's a lot of aspects to this. Teapot, I'm going to start with you. Good for the hobby, bad for the hobby. What does this mean? Big deal, little deal. Help us break this down. This uh, is another big strategic maneuver. We've seen a lot of this type of stuff happening over the last few years. I do want to know who is always leaking this stuff. Like, who's the Woj? Who's the Jeff yeah. Passan of sports cards? Is it Rovell? He seems to be always breaking these things. I'm kind of glad to have that. It's a little bit, you know, fun. But overall, this just seems to make a lot of sense. That we heard the rumors over the last few weeks. Is it true? Is it not? Um, I think this is something that really benefits the hobby in general. We know that a lot of people fund their hobby collection through grading by sending big you know, orders of cards. They hold back, they keep some of them, they like to sell others, and this just streamlines that. I am all about removing friction anywhere that the friction exists in the hobby, and I think this is really a cool idea. We know that PSA has had that direct to consignment through Golden, yeah. but when you have like a base you know, PSA 10 tops flagship for $20. A lot of those cards don't do particularly well on Golden. They were not, they were not doing great on Golden. They, that's not why people no. are on that platform. Correct. They're on there for the big dollar Correct. spotlight cards. This, you know, fixes that issue. I am curious just always about some of the logistics, like how exactly it's going to work. Is PSA as collectors going to have an eBay account or how does that get, get sold? Is it through some generic vault service, you know, account on eBay? What about when issues arise? Like who's responsible? Are you still gonna get your payout if they mess something up? Knowing collectors, knowing PSA, they usually make it right when they make a mistake on some of those things. So I'd expect they have all that stuff spelled out as this rolls out, but I'm really excited about it. And um, I, I will be curious to see how it impacts bulk submitters. If people will be more inclined yeah. to wanna send directly a PSA yeah. versus through a bulk submitter. But overall, I'm excited about it. Yeah, definitely big news. Do you agree, Doug, or what's your take on all of this? Yeah, I think it's a pretty good move for both of these companies. Uh, for eBay specifically, they 
offload their vault to PSA. And I don't know that that was a very successful endeavor for them, the, the eBay vault. I don't, I've never used it personally. I don't think I've ever talked to anyone who ever vaulted with eBay. Um, but what this does allow now is them to kind of take competition out of the marketplace by acquiring Golden. So they remove a competitor and maybe offload a service that wasn't highly used. So I think it works great for eBay. Uh, for PSA, I mean, this gives them a better option than Golden as far as going from grading to vaulting to, 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 the, to a marketplace. Yeah. Um, like you said, not every card is meant for Golden, right? But most of those cards are meant for eBay. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, this is kind of a lot of the model that PWCC has been doing, and PWCC has done it really well. A lot of people vault with PWCC. I vault with PWCC. And I think those logistical issues you mentioned where, like, who's going to be responsible for this mistake or what accounts are going to be listed under, that's another reason why I kind of like PS, PWCC in this. It's all under one roof, and it's all a little bit more seamless. So in that regard, you know, I'm probably still going to go that route when it makes sense, but this does open up a lot of possibilities for people, and I, do, I think it benefits both the companies and people of the hobby in general. Yeah. Yeah, I think you guys have a lot of spot on comments there. This is one of those rare situations where I think both teams actually won the trade. If we're putting this in sports analogies, I think as you said, Doug, like this is actually really good for eBay that Golden is now on their side. eBay had struggled to have high-end auctions work successfully on their platform ever since PWCC went away and went to and you know they they broke off, you know they broke off to go do their own thing, right? Um, now this gives eBay an option for the high-end auctions. It allows Golden to reconcentrate on the high-end auctions, which is what Golden's best at. The low-end stuff wasn't, wasn't selling as well on Golden. Golden's out of that business now, I presume. They're gonna be back on the high-end. eBay's got the lower end. And as you said, I'm gonna bring up one word that I think is really important in all of this on the PSA side. That is the word liquidity. What this does is this gives collectors even more liquidity. As you submit your cards for grading, Teapot, you talked about how important it was for people to grade and then sell. This allows this to happen more rapidly into a bigger audience of buyers. Yeah. So that whole thing about you're getting liquidity and that liquidity is speeding up and money's coming back to you and allowing you to buy more cards. This to me uh, allows all of that to happen in, in quicker order. So I, I, think it's a, I think it's a pretty exciting thing overall. It's going to be interesting to see where all of this goes from here. Uh, it's also going to be interesting to see how Fanatics responds to this. You can tell that collectors really wanted to try to get out in front of what Fanatics is trying to yeah, do, yeah. which is build that entire ecosystem. Michael Rubin talked about that from the very beginning, about how Fanatics wants to build the whole ecosystem of everything related to transacting with yeah. cards. They acquired PWCC. That's a big step forward for, for Fanatics. But now, now collectors and PSA have taken their own steps. So it's going to be interesting to see where Fanatics goes from here. Did they we'll get into more. grading in the future or what yeah. happens? I think we'll see more between that Fanatics PWCC relationship and kind of a, yep. another response and that type of thing. It's going to be interesting. Speaking of PWCC, they're a sponsor of the show and they've got an outstanding weekly auction up this week again, including a sealed box BBCE authenticated of 1981 Topps football. You guys know how I love opening some of those vintage boxes here on the Sports Card Investor channel. I may have to go after that one. Montana? Joe Montana yep. Rookies. Joe Montana Rookies. It's on the weekly auction on PWCC right now. Teapot, what do you have your eye on? I got a 1998 Stadium Club. You know I love Stadium Club. Co-signers, on-card auto, two autos. Peyton Manning, Dan Marino, PSA 10, Low pop, two of the greatest of all time. Uh, can't go wrong with that. Awesome card. Doug, how about you? 2014 Bowman Chrome Gold Mookie Bet. Whoa, oh, baseball. That's a big card. Rookie that's auto a big out of 50. That is crazy. That, that's yeah, a big baseball it, it, card. But I saw the card, and I don't think I've ever actually come across that card before. He's started the season so hot yeah, and is. looks like the front runner for the NL MVP. Yeah. So I don't know. I saw the card, and I was like, yeah, that makes sense. It's a beautiful card. It's Hard one card. to find. Yeah. Hard one to find. All of those cards, plus thousands more, are on PWCC Marketplace right now. And if you want to vault your own cards, PWCC Marketplace will take them for free. If they're $50 and over graded cards, submit them uh, to pwccmarketplace.com. Use promo code SCI when you're doing your vaulting submission so that they can take those cards for free. They're gonna insure them for free and store them for free for life. And of course, it's easy to sell them in the future once your cards are vaulted with PWCC. Okay, guys, let's turn to our data dive this week. Teapot, you did a nice data dive this last week and you dived into 90s inserts, 90s parallels. Parallels. I know this is, uh, yes, parallel specifically. I know this is a, you love kind of the late 90s stuff. Wasn't my era. 
Yeah. My era was the um, uh, more the 80s yeah. before we had all these shiny parallels. Um, but you pulled out some parallels from the 90s that you feel aren't getting quite enough attention. Tell us about this. Yeah, so we looked at a, a handful of them. These are the ones that are kind of a little sneakier, a mm -hmm. little more subtle. Uh, I started out with Stadium Club First Day Issues, Collector's Choice, Players Club Platinum, which get misslabbed by all the company. They're very easy, uh, confused, even though they should be more straightforward. Uh, 96 Skybox Rubies, the precursor to Star Rubies, which came in the, in the next two years. Precious Metal from 96 mm -hmm. Metal, which was the precursor to Precious Metal Gems. And then finally, 97 Flare Tiffany, really subtle blue Tiffany foil on them, kind of hard to hit. Um, all of them have good value, but they're sneaky and they would always get the eyes on them that the bigger, flashier parallels do. Yeah, these are interesting. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admit a little bit of, of an area of a lack of knowledge here in that some of these cards, the difference between inserts and parallels, yeah. right? And yeah. some of these late 90s cards, like I was a little surprised to see the rubies and the precious metal on your list. You're defining those as parallels not inserts. Right. Explain yeah. to me the nuance. Well, there. They're, they're, they are a parallel in the sense that they're, uh, they're a variation of the base card. Mm -hmm. So it's the base card just with a, di with a difference, right? Just like we see gold prisms, silver prisms, things like that. It's the base image. You can also have cases in the 90s uh, and even now where you have a parallel of an insert. So mm -hmm. these are parallels of base cards. Right. You can have uh, you know, um, high, high voltage and then 500 volts. You have a lot of different things right. like that in the 90s, but these are definitely categorized as parallels of base cards. There you go. Very, very good educational information there. Uh, Doug, what do you think of this list? Uh, has Teapot nailed it? These are, these are parallels that need to be paid more attention to, or are they, uh, or, or maybe is he missing some obvious ones here? Well, I'm glad you said it first because I'm also not 100% sure when I look at these. I don't look at a card from the 90s right away and know parallel versus insert. Mm. So I just looked at cards as a whole that I really liked from the 90s and then started put, putting together a list. So there might be inserts here. There might be parallels here. But from the ones that I think, from an eye appeal perspective, that I like the most, and I made a list here, uh, 98 Essential Credentials. Yes. One of my favorites, yeah, period. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you mentioned this recently, and I couldn't agree more, is 98 Bowman Atomic Refractors. Yeah. The gold, sort of cracked ice looking. Yep. Those are amazing. Uh, 96 Select Certified Mirror Gold. Those are very That's nice. old school Select, right? It's still the mm -hmm. same Select logo we're used to today, and those cards are beautiful. Um, Skybox Premium Rubies from 97. So it's kind of like, you know, the next year after the one that you were Star mentioning Root, before. Yeah. yeah. 98 Skybox Thunder Super Rave yep. is also Love a really, really fun card. Yep. So you can tell me which one of those are Those are all parallels. Nailed it. You, you nailed it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you nailed it. I'm just glad that we're not up here talking about really ugly cars like Jambalaya or oh, That's boy. Jam. Uh, so, starting yeah, a good wholesome conversation. He loves just throwing that into. Well, the those list. are inserts, right? Those are those they are, are inserts. No, those not, are inserts. Yeah, those are inserts. They, they would right. not be they would not be eligible for the list that we're talking about today. I'm going to give you what I believe is a parallel of an insert, just okay. to make sure I've got this whole thing right here. The 1998 Skybox Molten Metal. The titanium fusion number yeah. to 40. Yeah. Would you consider that a, a... It's a parallel of an insert. A parallel of an insert, yeah. because the insert is the regular fusion that's numbered to 250. Yeah. And the titanium fusion, which is numbered to 40, which is the gold-looking version of the regular. So that's a parallel of an insert. Am I right on that? Yeah, that's it. And that said in the platinum portraits can be a little bit confusing. I love platinum We're portraits. out of time to specify, but you've got the general right <laughs> idea. Okay. Yes, we there's need, some more nuance. Is there any a, 90s in that book? We need there? a few we need a future data data dive video. Yeah, actually Teapot wrote the 1990s card uh, section yeah, of this book, there. thankfully. Yeah. Uh, he was obviously They a big, had to cut a lot of pages. I got a little crazy. <laughs> but um but uh, we need a future data dive video on the nuances between inserts and parallels in the late 1990s to make, sure, to make sure that Not Doug and I have our definitions proper of okay. inserts and parallels in the late 90s. Cards. I'll work on so, that. There you go, guys. That data dive is available on YouTube on the Market Movers YouTube channel. Teapot puts great stuff out every Saturday on the Market Movers YouTube channel. Check it out. Speaking of YouTube, I got to tell you about a very special event that is happening this weekend. This is super exciting. This Saturday here on the Sports Card Investor YouTube channel, it is Trade Night Live from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern Time on the Sports Card Investor YouTube. We will be live from the show floor of Cards HQ, and I will be doing trade deals live with customers who walk in the door as part of our trade night. I'm not sure that's ever been done before in YouTube sports card history. If it is, I haven't seen it. I think it may be a brand new thing. It's gonna be a lot of fun. I'm even gonna be turning to the chat to get opinions from the chat on whether I should do the trade deal or not. So tune in between 4 and 7 p.m. Saturday. And then starting at 7 p.m., going all the way till midnight, 
I'm going to go on Whatnot, and we are doing a very special break on the Cards HQ Breaks channels on Whatnot. We're breaking six cases of Topps Tribute Baseball. It's one of my favorite products. I will be personally doing the break, and we're going to auction off every break spot starting at just $1. It is on Whatnot, the Cards HQ Breaks channel on Whatnot starting 7 p.m. Eastern Saturday. So make sure you mark your calendar Saturday for those two special events. Okay guys, let's get into the mailbag portion of the show. Some really interesting things happened over the last week. One was 1 million Cubs. This collector, you probably have seen him on social media before. He's got a very active uh, Twitter account, X. Um, he's on Instagram and he has been on a mission for the last six and a half years, I believe it is, to build literally a collection of 1 million Cubs cards, 1 million Chicago Cubs cards. Bo Thompson is the collector's name, and he just hit his 1 millionth card. And what makes this newsworthy, in addition to just hitting that milestone, is the fact that Topps caught wind of this, wanted to really celebrate him and make that special. So his 1 millionth card was actually given to him at Wrigley Field at a special event where Topps, he was able to throw out the first pitch at Wrigley Field, and then his one millionth card, a tops, uh, tops gave it to him. It was a super fractor yeah. of himself in a top, you know, Cubs hat. So that that was the one millionth card. Uh, what do we think about all of this? Make sense of all of this for me, Doug. I'm going to start with you. Feel very sorry for the person that had to count one million of these cards and verify them. Assuming that some was form, <laughs> assuming some form of verification was done on this, I can imagine somebody's just rifling through Ryan Sandberg after Ryan Sandberg, Mark Grace after Mark Grace, and that was probably Carrie a pretty Wood. It, it probably a, few, a pretty few terrible Wood cards in there too, probably probably a terrible experience. Um, but I think it's very cool that he was honored by the Cubs. I think it was very cool what Topps did. I can't imagine getting your own super fractor made for you. That's got to be a really cool experience, I'm sure. Um, but I do wonder, like, you know, what kind of precedent or, you know, the sets, because if we're going to, if we're going to start honoring super collectors, then we'll have to have guidelines on who qualifies as a super collector. Then things get a little weird there because, you know, people are going to argue over what makes someone a super collector. Uh, or you're going to have people going out to every dollar bin they can find or every estate sale with junk wax and spending five bucks to buy, you know, these bolt cards and try to be honored as some kind of super collector. So, you know, that, that might be a little weird if we start to you know, try to do more of that. But in this one isolated incident, I think it's very cool. You agree, Teapot? And, and how else should Tops recognize super collectors? If obviously, as Doug said, maybe you can't do this every single yeah. time, but what are what are ways Tops can recognize collectors? Or more? maybe they can do it every time and yeah. we just pull people out. I mean, I think it's pretty cool. Here's what I'll say. Um, I can't imagine having one million cards. I have many thousands of cards. And recently, as I've been sorting and thinking about what can I display and what, I'm like, I gotta sell some of this. It's so much, like how do you actually enjoy having that many cards? Do you ever look at them? Does he have it cataloged digitally for search a bit, like to look up what he has? I'd like to know like, what card does he have the most copies of? Because presumably he's got many duplicates of particular things, but far be it from me to knock anybody's collecting style. You know I'm not about that. If you wanna be one of these big volume collectors, more power to you. Um, somebody's gotta know what to do with that all someday. Uh, but I, you know, I, I generally like seeing people who have that much passion and that much dedication, and I'm all about them getting spotlighted in some way. To define super collector, I don't know if we'll ever define SSP or super collector first. Both of those <laughs> things get used quite um, liberally sometimes. Uh, but I'm definitely never going for one million Drummonds. I've got a few thousand, and that's probably plenty. Yeah, I mean, it is a huge accomplishment. You it know, is. this guy set out, and very publicly, he created yeah. his accounts, one million Cubs. Yeah, he stuck with it. And he stuck with it for six and a half years. And as you said, Doug, I can't imagine the actual cataloging of yeah. what, a, what a million of these cards looks it's like. Dedication. It's dedication. It is really dedication. Well, listen, kudos kudos to Bo Thompson and kudos to Tops as well for putting on such a nice event. I think that was a really, really cool thing yeah, nice gesture. Uh, that they did. All right, guys, let's jump to our second mailbag topic of the day. There have been, you know, Fanatics has made a pattern. Fanatics and Tops have made a pattern over the last year of trying to find ways to insert new interest into new card sets that are coming along. Yeah. Some call it brilliant marketing. Some call it a gimmick. They're at it again. We now have seen that there is going to be a Juan Soto card in Heritage, uh, which has autographed my first auto as a Yankee. That's yeah. the inscription. So Juan Soto signs it and, and inscribes my first auto as a Yankee. That is probably now a big chase. I imagine people are ripping Heritage right now looking for that card. In addition to that, 
We saw that there's a, uh, a one of the a baseball player from the Angels, uh, Nolan Shanuel, actually has at the end of his bat, he uh, uh, the bat knob is a little image of his uh, 2024 Topps rookie card from Series One, mm. which is pretty cool. And you have to wonder is is that going to end up in a in a set later in the year? Inception. Are they going to buy one of his ba- you know buy one of his bats and chop off the ba- bat knob and then that's a bat knob insert and you know, in uh, Definitive or Dynasty or Diamond Kings or, you know, something that comes out later this year. Is this is this getting too gimmicky at this point or do we absolutely love this stuff? Doug, I'm going to start with you. I guess the concern is, are we reaching like a point of burnout with all the different gimmicks that are coming out? And I would say not really. Um, I mean, it's kind of early in the Fanatics uh, ownership here. And I think they're trying a lot of different things to see what works. And I love that. You know, many times on the show, I've said it's not for me, but I'm glad they're trying it. So as long as they're trying things, seeing if it works, keep the things that work, get rid of the things that don't work, then I think it's a really cool thing. Um, me in particular, my favorite thing they've done so far is, is push forward on inscriptions on autos. I've really appreciated seeing all the inscriptions. I did a lot of Bowman U stuff, so for all the Kentucky guys with their you know, inscriptions on the Kentucky cards, I think that's awesome. Uh, I know there was a lot of people not loving that Victor Wimbenyama card that he doodled on. I absolutely loved it where he like you know drew a mustache on himself and the little alien spaceship. I loved all of that. I think the, ins- in the inscriptions are the coolest thing they've done so far. The other stuff hasn't really hit for me, but I'm glad that they're going to keep trying it. Just get rid of the stuff that doesn't work, keep the stuff that does, and then maybe we-, we have to do less gimmicks in the future. I agree with you on the inscriptions. I think that's a cool way to make cards unique. No one has yet found that Tom Brady, the 12 out of 50, with that inscription with the $500,000 bounty, the, you know, if football doesn't work out, there's always baseball. Let's go open some now. <laughs> uh, or if baseball doesn't work out, there's yeah. always football, actually. Sure. Either is way. Inscri- no one has found it yet, which yeah. is pretty wild. But yeah, those those types of inscriptions, this Juan Soto inscription, I agree with you um, on the Web and Yama. Like, it's, I, think, I think that's fun. What do you think, Teapot? Are you on board with this stuff or no? I worry about too much of a good yeah. thing, but in this case, the inscriptions, to me, really can't be overdone. With the Wemby, I think maybe if it weren't on the one of one, like on a number to 99, that's cool because it's a unique chase. People sort of view that one of one as like sacred. Yeah. You know, they're like, I don't want that. But it's up to him and I thought it was pretty fun. I like the inscriptions. I love that baseball players in general tend to take their autographs more seriously yeah. than other sports. That's most important to me. Make the auto, not streak. Try to sign it nicely. Have a nice looking auto. That's step one. Inscriptions are awesome. Um, If they are going to expand the firsts, like a bat knob and bases and all that stuff, what I really think they should consider is doing it with some continuity so that the card design follows like what it did with the MLB debut patch, but with a different insertion. So there creates some kind of a lineage across sets. There's some continuity. That to me seems less gimmicky. It's more like MLB debut patch, everybody accepts as the thing. And then there's like inferior chases that are associated with it. If somebody wanted to go for like the whole run, but definitely don't overdo that, I, I would say. Yeah, the first the first moment cards, you know, where they put the bases and everything in there. I know they're going to continue to to promote those in the future and do more with them. Yeah. Um. And and maybe maybe this bat knob bat knob finds its way into one of those cards. I certainly would not be surprised if that's the case. I think it's all cool. I think it's good marketing. So far, so good. I hope we see more of it. And I hope we see you. I hope we see you on Saturday as part of our special live stream from 4 to 7 p.m. here on the Sports Card Investor Channel. And then I hope we see you Saturday night from 7 p.m. to midnight, of course, all Eastern time on Whatnot on the Cards HQ Breaks account on Whatnot. And I also hope we see you shopping in that PWCC weekly auction on Sunday. Don't forget to get your copy of Sports Card Collecting and Investing for Dummies. And we'll see you next time. Take care.